My Bondage and My Freedom. Chapter 24. 21 Months in Great Britain. The allotments of Providence, when coupled with trouble and anxiety, often conceal from infinite vision the wisdom and goodness in which they are sent, and frequently what seemed a harsh and invidious dispensation is converted by after experience into a happy and beneficial arrangement. Thus the painful liability to be returned again to slavery, which haunted me by day and troubled my dreams at night, proved to be a necessary step in the path of knowledge and usefulness. The writing of my pamphlet in the spring of 1845 endangered my liberty, and led me to seek a refuge from republican slavery and monarchical England. A rude, uncultivated fugitive slave was driven by stern necessity to that country to which young American gentlemen go to increase their stock of knowledge, to seek pleasure, and to have their rough democratic manners softened by contact with English aristocratic refinement. On applying for a passage to England on board the Cambria of the Cunard Line, my friend James N. Buffum, of Lynn, Massachusetts, was informed that I could not be received on board as a cabin passenger. American prejudice against colored triumph over British liberty and civilization, and erected a color test and condition for crossing the sea in the cabin of a British vessel. The insult was keenly felt by my white friends, but to me it was common, expected, and therefore a thing of no great consequence. Whether I went in common, the cabin, or in the steerage, moreover, I felt that if I could not get into the first cabin, first cabin passengers could come into the second cabin, and the result justified my anticipations to the fullest extent. And so far from being degraded by being placed in the second cabin, that part of the ship became the scene of as much pleasure and refinement during the voyage as the cabin itself. The Hutchinson family, celebrated vocalists and fellow passengers, often came to my rude forecastle deck and sung their sweeter songs, enlivening the place with eloquent music as well as spirited conversation during the voyage. In two days after leaving Boston, one part of the ship was about as free to me as another. My fellow passengers not only visited me, but invited me to visit them upon the saloon deck. My visits there, however, were but seldom. I preferred to live within my privileges, and keep under upon my own premises. I found this quite as much in accordance with good policy as with my own feelings. The effect was that with the majority of the passengers all color distinctions were flung to the winds, and I found myself treated with every mark of respect, from the beginning to the end of the voyage, except in a single instance, and in that I came near being mobbed for complying with an invitation given me by the passengers and the captain of the Cambria to deliver a lecture on slavery. Our New Orleans and Georgia passengers were pleased to regard my lecture as an insult offered to them, and I swore I should not speak. They went so far as to threaten to throw me overboard, but for the firmness of Captain Judkins, probably would have, under the inspiration of slavery and brandy. They attempted to put their threats into execution, I have no space to describe this scene, though it is tragic and comic peculiarities are well worth describing. An end was put to the melee by the captains calling the ship's company to put the salt-water mubocrats in irons. At this determined order the gentlemen of the lash scampered, and for the rest of the voyage conducted themselves very decorously. This incident of the voyage and two days after landing at Liverpool brought me at once before the British public, and that by no act of my own. The gentlemen so promptly stumped in their mediated violence flew to the press to justify their conduct and to denounce me as a worthless and insolent negro. This course was even less wise than it conduct it was intended to sustain, for, besides awakening something like a national interest in me and securing me an audience, it brought out counter-statements and threw the blame upon themselves, which they had sought to fasten upon me and the gallant captain of the ship. Some notion may be formed of the difference of my feelings and circumstances while aboard, from the following extract from one of the series of letters addressed by me to a Mr. Garrison and published in the Liberator. It was written on the first day of January, 1846. My dear friend Garrison, up to this time I have given no direct expression of the views, feelings, and opinions which I have formed respecting the character and conditions of the people of this land. 
I have refrained thus purposely. I wish to speak advisably, and in order to do this I have to wait till, I trust, experience has brought my opinions to an intelligent maturity. I have been thus careful, not because I think what I say will have much effect in shaping the opinions of the world, but because whatever of influence I may possess, whatever little or much, I wish it to go in the correct direction, and according to truth. I hardly need say that, in speaking of Ireland, I shall be influenced by no prejudices in favour of America. I think my circumstances all forbid that. I have no end to serve, no creed to uphold, and no government to defend. And as to nation, I belong to none. I have no protection at home, or resting place abroad. The land of my birth welcomes me to her shores only as a slave and spurns with contempt the idea of treating me differently, so that I am an outcast from the society of my childhood, and an outlaw in the land of my birth. I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. That men should be patriotic is to me perfectly natural, and as a philosophical fact, I am able to give an intellectual recognition. But no further can I go. If I ever had any patriotism or any capacity for the feeling, it was whipped out of me long since by the lash of the American soul drivers. In thinking of America, I sometimes find myself admiring her bright blue sky, her grand old woods, her fertile fields and her beautiful rivers, her mighty lakes and her star-crowned mountains. But my rapture is soon checked, and my joy is soon turned to mourning, when I remember that all is cursed with the infernal spirit of slave-holding, robbery, and wrong. When I remember that with the waters of her noblest rivers, the tears of my brethren are born to the ocean, disregarded and forgotten, and that our most fertile freeds drink daily the warm blood of my outraged sisters, I am filled with utterable loathing, and led to reproach myself that anything could fall from my lips in praise of such a land. America will not allow her children to love her, she seems bent on compelling those who would be her warmest friends to be her worst enemies. May God give her repentance before it is too late, is the ardent prayer of my heart. I will continue to pray, labor, and wait, believing that she cannot always be insensible to the dictates of justice or deaf to the voice of humanity. My opportunities for learning the character and condition of the people of this land have been very great. I have travelled almost from the hill of Howth to the Giant's Cassaway, and from the Giant's Cassaway to Cape Clear. During these trials, I have met with much in the character and condition of the people to approve, and much to condemn, much that has thrilled me with pleasure, and very much that has filled me with pain. I write in this letter, and attempt to give any description of those scenes which have given me pain. This I will do hereafter. I have enough and more than your subscribers will be disposed to read at any one time, of the bright side of the picture. I can truly say, I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. The warm and generous cooperation extended to me by the friends of my despised race, the prompts and liberal manner with which the press has rendered me its aid, and the glorious enthusiasm with which thousands have flocked to hear the cruel wrongs of my downtrodden and long-enslaved fellow countrymen portrayed, the deep sympathy for the slave, and the strong abhorrence of the slaveholder, is everywhere evinced. The cordiality with which members and ministers of various religious bodies and of various shades of religious opinions have embraced me and lent me their aid, the kind of hospitality constantly preferred to me by persons of the highest ranks within society, and the spirit of freedom that seems to animate all with whom I come in contact, the entire absence of everything that looked like prejudice against me on account of the color of my skin, contrasted so strongly with my long and bitter experience in the United States that I look with wonder and amazement upon the transition. In the southern part of the United States, I was a slave, thought of and spoken of as property, in the language of the law, held, taken, reputed, and abjugated to be chattel in the hands of my owners and processors, and the extractors, administrators, and assigns to all intents, contractions, and purposes whatsoever. Bereaved Digest, 2024. 224. In the northern states, a fugitive slave, liable to be hunted upon at any moment, like a felon, and to be hurled into the terrible jaws of slavery, doomed by an intervent prejudice against color to insult and outrage on every hand. 
Massachusetts out of the question, denied the privileges and courtesies common to others in the use of the most humble means of conveyance, shut out from the cabins or on steamboats, refused admission to respectable hotels, caricatured, scorned, scoffed, mocked, maltreated, and impunity by any one, no matter how black their heart. So he has a white skin. But now behold the change. Eleven days and a half gone, and I have crossed three thousand miles of the perilous deep. Instead of a democratic government, I am under a monarchical government. Instead of the bright blue sky of America, I am covered with the soft gray fog of the Emerald Isle. I breathe, and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I gaze around in vain for any one who will question my equal humanity, claim me as a slave, or offer me an insult. I employ a cab. I am seated beside white people. I reach the hotel, and I enter into the same door. I am shown into the same parlor, and I dine at the same table, and not a one is offended. No delicate nose grows deformed in my presence. I find no difficulty here in obtaining admission into any place of worship, instruction, or amusement. I am on equal terms with people as white as any I ever saw in the United States. I meet nothing to remind me of my complexion. I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and deference paid to the white people. When I go to church, I am met by no upturned nose. No scornful lip opens to tell me that we don't allow niggers in here. I remember, about two years ago, there was in Boston, near the southeastern corner of Boston Common, a menagerie. I had long desired to see such a collection as I understood was being exhibited there and never had any opportunity while a slave. I resolved to see this, my first since my escape. I went, and as I approached the entrance to gain admission, I was met and told by the doorkeeper, in a harsh and contemptuous tone, We don't allow niggers in here. I also remember attending a revival meeting in the Reverend Henry Jackson's meeting house at New Bedford, and going up to the broad aisle to a front seat. I was met by a good deacon, who told me in a quite pious tone, We don't allow niggers in here. Soon after my arrival in New Bedford, from the south, I had a strong desire to attend the Lycaeum, but was told they don't allow niggers in here. And while passing from New York to Boston upon the steamer Massachusetts on the night of the 9th of December, 1843, when chilled almost through with the cold, I went into the cabin to get a little warm and I was soon touched upon the shoulder by a courtier and told, We don't allow niggers in here. On arrival in Boston, from an anti-slavery tour, I was hungry and tired. I went into an eating house, and near my friend Mr. Campbell's, to get some refreshments. I was met by a lad in a white apron. Oh, we don't allow niggers in here. A week or two before leaving the United States, I had a meeting appointed at Weymouth, the home of that glorious band of true abolitionists, the Weston family, and others. And on an attempt to take a seat upon the omnibus to that place, I was told by the driver, and I shall never forget his fiendish hate, I don't allow niggers in here. Thank heaven for the respite I now enjoy. I have been in Dublin but a few days, when a gentleman of great respectability kindly offered to conduct me through all the public buildings of that beautiful city. A little afterward I found myself dining with the Lord Mayor of Dublin. What a pity there was not some American democratic Christian at the door of his splendid match and to bark out in my approach, Oh, no, 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 they don't allow niggers in here. The truth is, the people here know nothing of the Republican Negro prevalent in our glorious land. The measure they esteem men according to their moral and intellectual worth. There is not an accordance to the color of their skin. Whatever may be said of the aristocracies here, there is none based on the color of a man's skin. This species of aristocracy belongs permanently to the land of the free and the home of the brave. I have never found it abroad, in any but Americans. It sticks to them wherever they go. They found it almost as hard to get rid of as to get rid of their own white skins. The second day after my arrival upon Liverpool, in company with my friend Buffman and several other friends, I went to Eaton Hall, the residence of the Marquis of Westminster, 
one of the most splendid buildings in England. Upon approaching the door I found several of our American passengers, who came out with us in the Cambria, waiting for admission, as but one party was allowed in the house at a time. We all had to wait till the company within came out, and of all the faces, expressions of chagrin, those of the Americans were permanent. They looked as sour as vinegar than as bitter's gold, when they found that I was to be admitted upon equal terms with them. When the door was open, I walked in, on an equal footing with my white fellow citizens, and from all I could see, I had as much attention paid to me by the servants that showed us through the house as any with a paler skin. As I walked through the building, the statuary did not fall down, the pictures did not leap from their places, the doors did not refuse to open, and the servants did not say, We do not allow niggers in here. A happy and wondrous new year to you, and all their friends of freedom. My time and labours while abroad here divided between England, Ireland, and Scotland, and Wales. Upon this experience alone, I might write a book twice the size of this, my bondage and my freedom. I visited and I lectured in nearly all the large towns and cities within the United Kingdom, and enjoyed many favourable opportunities for observation and information, but books on England are already abundant, and the public may therefore dismiss any fear that I am mediating another infliction upon that line, though in truth I would very much like to write a book on those countries, if for nothing else to make grateful mention of the many dear friends whose benevolent actions towards me are ineffaceably stamped upon my memory and warmly treasured within my heart. To those friends I owe my freedom within the United States. On their own motion, without any solicitation from me, a Miss Henry Richardson, a clever lady, remarkable for her devotion to every good work, and taking the lead, raised a fund sufficient to purchase my freedom, and actually paid it over. They placed the papers of my mammation in my hand, before they would tolerate the idea of me returning to this, my native country. To this commercial transaction I owe my exemption from the democratic operation of the Fugitive Slave Bill of 1850. But for this I might at any time become a victim of the most cruel and scandalous enactment and be doomed to end my life, as I began it a slave. The sum paid for my freedom was one hundred and fifty pounds sterling. Some of my uncompromising anti-slavery friends in this country failed to see the wisdom of this arrangement. They were not pleased that I consented to it, even by my silence. They thought it a violation of anti-slavery principles, conceding a right of the property in man, and a wasteful expenditure of money. On the other hand, viewing it simply in the light of a ransom, or as money extorted by a robber, and my liberty of more value than a simple one hundred and fifty pounds sterling. I could not see either a violation of the laws of morality or those of economy within the transaction. It is true, I was not in the possession of my claimants, and could have easily remained in England, for the same friends who had so generously purchased my freedom would have assisted me in establishing myself in that new country. To this, however, I could not consent. I felt that I had a duty to perform, and that was to labor and suffer with the oppressed within my native land. Considering, therefore, all the circumstances, the Fugitive Slave Bill included, I think the very best thing was done in letting Mr. Hugh have the one hundred and fifty pounds sterling, leaving me free to return to my appropriate field of labor. Had I been a private person, having no other relations or duties than those of a personal and family nature, I should never have consented to the payment of so large a sum for the privilege of living securely under our glorious republican form of government. I would have remained within England, or have gone to some other country, or perhaps I could even have lived unobserved in this. But to this I could not consent. I had already become somewhat notorious and withal quite as unpopular as and notorious, and I was therefore much exposed to arrest and recapture. The main object to which my labours in Great Britain were directed was the concentration of the moral and religious sentiment of its people against American slavery. England often is charged with having established slavery in the United States, and if there were no other justification than this, for appealing to our people to lend their moral aid for the abolition of slavery, I should be justified. 
My speeches in Great Britain were wholly extra temperous, and I may not always have been so guarded in my expressions, so as I otherwise should have been. I was ten years younger then than now, and only seven years from slavery. I cannot give the reader a better idea of the nature of my discourses than by publishing one of them, delivered in Finsbury Chapel, London, to an audience of about two thousand persons, in which I was published in the London universe at the time. Those of the United States who may regard the speech as being harsh in its spirit, and unjust in its statements, because delivered before an audience supposed to be anti-republican in their principles and feelings, may view the matter differently, when they learn that the case supposed did not exist. It so happened that the great mass of the people in England who attended and patronized my anti-slavery meetings were, in truth, about as good Republicans as the mass of Americans. And with this decided advantage over the latter, they are lovers of Republicanisms for all men, for black men as well as for white men. They are the people who sympathize with Louis Cusseth and Mazzini, and with oppressed and enslaved, of every color and nation. The world over the constitute the democratic elements in British politics, and are as much opposed to the union of church and state as we in America are to such a union. At the meeting where the speech was delivered, Joseph Sturge, a worldwide philanthropist and a member of the Society of Friends, presided and addressed the meeting. George William Alexander, another friend, who has spent more than one an American fortune in promoting the anti-slavery cause in different sections of the world, was upon the platform. Also a Dr. Campbell, now of the British Banner, who combines all the human tenderness of Melanchthon with the directness and boldness of Luther. He is in the very front ranks of nonconformists, and looks with no unfriendly eye upon America. George Thompson, too, was there. An American will yet own that he did a true man's work in relighting the rapidly dying out fire of true republicanism in the American heart, and be ashamed of the treatment he met at her hands. Coming generations in this country will applaud the spirit of this much-abused Republican friend of freedom. There were others of note seated upon the platform, who would gladly engraft upon English institutions all that is purely Republican in the institutions of America. Nothing, therefore, must be set upon against this speech, on the score that it is delivered in the presence of those who cannot appreciate the many excellent things belonging to our system of government and with view to stir up prejudice against republican institutions. Again, let it also be remembered, for it is the simple truth, that neither in the speech, nor in any other which I delivered in England, did I ever allow myself to address Englishmen as against Americans. I took my stand on the high ground of human brotherhood. I spoke to the Englishmen as men, in behalf of men. Slavery is a crime not against Englishmen, but against God, and all the members of the human family, and it belongs to the whole human family to seek its suppression. And a letter to Mr. Greeley of the New York Tribune, written while abroad, I spoke. I am nevertheless aware that the wisdom of exposing the sins of one nation in the ear of another has been seriously questioned by good and clear-sighted people both on this and on your side of the Atlantic, and the thought is not without weight on my own mind. I am satisfied that there are many evils which can be best removed by confining our efforts to the immediate locality where such evils exist. This, however, is by no means the case with the system of slavery. It is such a giant sin, such a monstrous aggregation of iniquity, so hardening to the human heart, and so destructive to the moral sense, and so well calculated to beget a character in every one around it favorable to its own countenance, that I feel not only at liberty, but abundantly justified in appealing to the whole world to aid in its removal. But even if I had, as has often been charged, labored to bring American institutions generally into disrepute, and have not confined my labors strictly within the limits of humanity and morality, I should not have been without illustrious examples to support me. Driven into semi-exile by civil and barbarous laws, and by a system which cannot be thought of without a shudder, 
I was fully justified in turning, if possible, the tide of the moral universe against the heaven-daring outrage. Four circumstances greatly assisted me in getting the question of American slavery before the British public. First, the mob on board the Cambria, already referred to, which was a sort of national announcement of my arrival in England. Secondly, the highly reprehensible course pursued by the Free Church of Scotland in soliciting, receiving, and retaining money and its sustained funding for supporting the gospel in Scotland, which is evidently the ill-gotten gain of slaveholders and slave traders. Third, the Great Evangelical Alliance, or rather, the attempt to form such an alliance, which should include slaveholders of a certain description, added immensely to the interest felt in the slavery question. And, about the same time, there was the World's Temperance Convention, where I had the misfortune to come in collision with sundry American doctors of divinity, Dr. Cox among the number, with whom I had a small controversy. It has happened to me, as it has happened to most other men engaged in a good cause, often to be more indebted to my enemies than to my own skill or to the assistance of my friends. For whatever success has attended my labors, great surprise was expressed by American newspapers, North and South, during my stay in Great Britain. That a person so illiterate and insignificant as myself could awaken an interest so marked in England. These papers were not the only parties surprised. I was myself not far behind them in surprise. But the very contempt and scorn, the systemic and extravagant disparagement of which I was the object, served, perhaps, to magnify my few merits, and to render me of some account, whether deserving or not. A man is sometimes made great by the greatness of the abuse a portion of mankind may think proper to heap upon him. Whether I was of as much consequence as the English papers made me out to be, or not, it was easily seen. In England, I could not be the ignorant and worthless creature some of the American papers would have them believe I was. Men in their senses do not bowie knives to kill mosquitoes nor pistols to shoot at flies. And the American passengers, who thought proper to get up a mob to silence beyond board the Cambria, took the most effective method of telling the British public that I had something to say. But to the second circumstance, namely the position of the Free Church of Scotland, with the great Dr. Chalmers, Cunningham, and Candlish at its head, that church with its leaders put it out of the power of the scot people to ask the old question which we in the north have often most wickedly asked what have we to do with slavery that church had taken the price of blood into its treasury with which to build free churches and to pay free church ministers for preaching the gospel and worse still when honest john murray of boland bay now gone to his reward in heaven with William Smeal, Andrew Patton, Frederick Card, and other sterling anti-slavery men in Glasgow, denounced the transaction as disgraceful and shocking to the religious sentiments of those of Scotland. This church, through its leading divines, instead of repenting and seeking to mend the mistake into which it had fallen, made it a flagrant sin by undertaking to defend in the name of God and the Bible the principle not only of taking the money of slave-dealers to build churches, but of holding fellowship with the holders and traffickers in human flesh. This, the reader will see, brought up the whole question of slavery, and opened the way to its full discourse, without any agency of mine. I have never seen a people more deeply moved than were the people of Scotland upon this very question. Public meeting succeeded public meeting, speech after speech, pamphlet after pamphlet, editorial after editorial, sermon after sermon, soon lashed the conscientious Scotch people into a perfect fever. Send back the money! Was indignantly cried out from Green Rock to Edinburgh, and from Edinburgh to Aberdeen. 
George Thompson of London, Henry C. Wright of the United States, James N. Buffman of Lynn, Massachusetts, and myself were on the anti-slavery side, and Dr. Calmers, Cunningham, and Candlish upon the other. In a conflict where the latter would have had even the show of right, the truth in our hands, as against them, must have been driven to the wall. And while I believe we were able to carry the consciousness of the country against the actions of the free church, the battle, it must be confessed, was a hard-fought one. Abler defenders of the doctrine of fellowshipping trade shaveholders as Christians have not been met with. In defending this doctrine, it was necessary to deny that slavery is a sin. If driven from this position, they were compelled to deny that slaveholders were responsible for their sin, and if driven from both these positions, they must deny that it is a sin in such a sense, and that slaveholders are sinners in such a sense, as to make it wrong, and the circumstances in which they were placed to recognize them as Christians. Dr. Cunningham was the most powerful debater on the slavery side of the question. Mr. Thompson was the ablest upon the anti-slavery side. A scene occurred between these two men, a parallel to which I think I have never witnessed before, and I know I never have since. The scene was caused by a single exclamation on the part of a Mr. Thompson. The General Assembly of the Free Church was in progress at Cannon Mills, Edinburgh. The building would uphold about 2,500 persons, and on this occasion it was densely packed. Notice having been given that doctors Cunningham and Cantlish would speak that day in defence of the relations of the Free Church of Scotland to slavery in America. Messrs. Thompson, Buffman, myself, and a few anti-slavery friends attended, but sat at such a distance and in such a position that perhaps we were not observed from the platform. The excitement was intense, having been greatly increased by a series of meetings held by Messrs. Thompson, Wright, Buffman, and myself. In the most splendid hall, and in that most beautiful city, just previous to the meetings of the General Assembly, send back the money, started at us from every street corner. Send back the money, in large capitals, adorn the broad flags of the pavement. Send back the money, was the chorus of the popular street songs, and send back the money, was the heading of leading editorials in those daily newspapers. This day at Cannon Mills the great doctors of the church were to give an answer to this loud and stern demand. Men of all parties and all sects were most eager to hear. Something great was expected. The occasion was great, the men great, and great speeches were expected from them. In addition to the outside pressures upon a doctor's cunning and candlish, there was wavering in their own ranks. The consciousness of the church itself was not at ease. A dissatisfaction with the position of the church touching slavery was sensibly manifest among the members, and something must be done to counteract this unturned influence. The great Dr. Chalmers was in feeble health. At the time, his most potent eloquence could not be summoned to Cannon Mills. He whose voice was able to render asunder and dash down the granite halls of the established Church of Scotland, and to lead a host in solemn procession from it, as from a doomed city, was now old and enfeebled. Besides, he had said his word on this very question, and his word had not silenced the clamour without, nor stilled the anxious heavings within. The occasion was momentous and felt to be so. The church was in a perilous condition. A change of some sort must take place in her condition, or she must go and be shaken to pieces. To stand where she did was impossible. The whole weight of the matter fell on Cunningham and Candlish. No shoulders in the church were broader than theirs, and I must say, badly as I detest the principles laid down and defended by them, I was compelled to acknowledge the vast mental endowments of the men. Cunningham rose, and his rising was the signal for an almost tumultuous pause. You will say this was scarcely in keeping with the solemnity of the occasion, but to me it served to increase its grandeur and gravity. The applause, though tremulous, was not joyous. It seemed to me, as it thundered up from the vast audience, like the fall of an immense shaft, flung from shoulders already galled by its crushing weight. It was like saying, Doctor, we have borne this burden long enough, 
and willingly fling it upon you, since it was you who brought it upon us. Take it now, do what you will with it, for we are weary to bear it. Dr. Cunningham proceeded with his speech, abounding in logic, learning, and eloquence, and apparently bearing down all opposition. But at that moment, that fatal moment, when he was just bringing all his arguments to a point, and that point being that neither Jesus Christ nor his holy apostles regarded slaveholding as a sin, George Thompson, in a clear, sinuous, but rebuking voice, broke the deep stillness of the audience, exclaiming, Hear, hear, hear. The effect of this simple and common exclamation is almost incredible. It was as if a granite wall had been suddenly flung up against the advancing current of a mighty river. For a moment, speaker and audience were brought to a dead silence. Both the doctor and his hearer seemed appalled by the audacity, as well as the fitness of the rebuke. At length, a shout went up to the cry of, "'Put him out!' Happily, no one attempted to execute this cowardly order, and the doctor then proceeded with his douse course. Not, however, as before, did the learned doctor proceed. The exclamation of Thompson must have re-echoed itself a thousand times in his memory, and during the remainder of his speech, for the doctor never recovered from that blow. The deed was done, however. The pillars of the church, the proud pre-church of Scotland, was committed, and the humility of repentance was absent. The free church held on to the blood-stained money, and continued to justify itself in its position, and, of course, to apologize for slavery, and so does to this day but she glossed a glorious opportunity for giving her voice, her vote, and her example to the cause of humanity, and today she is staggering under the curse of the enslaved, whose blood is upon her skirts. The people of the Scotland are to this day deeply grieved at the course pursued by the free church, and would hail as a relief from deep and blighted shame the sending back the money to the slaveholders from whom it was gathered. On good result followed the conduct of the Free Church. It furnished an occasion for making the people of Scotland thoroughly acquainted with the character of slavery, and for arraying against the system the moral and religious sentiment of that country. Therefore, while we did not succeed in accomplishing the specific object of our mission, namely procuring the sending back of the money, we were amply justified by the good which really did result from our labours. Next comes the Evangelical Alliance. This was an attempt to form a union of all evangelical Christians throughout the world. Sixty or seventy American divines attended, and some of them went there merely to weave a worldwide garment with which to clothe the evangelical slaveholders. Foremost among these divines was the Reverend Samuel Hanson Cox, moderator of the New School Presbyterian General Assembly. He and his friends spared no pains to secure a platform broad enough to hold American slaveholders, and in his party succeedly. But the question of slavery is too large a question to be finally disposed of, even by the Evangelical Alliance. We appealed from the judgment of the Alliance to the judgment of the people of Great Britain, and with the happiest effect. This controversy with the Alliance might be made the subject of extended remark, but I must forbear, except to say that this effort to shield the Christian character of slaveholders greatly served to open a way to the British ear for anti-slavery discussion and that it was well improved. The fourth and last circumstance that assisted me in getting before the British public was an attempt on the part of certain doctors of divinity to silence me on the platform of the World's Temperance Convention, where I was brought into point-blank collision with the Reverend Dr. Cox, who made the subject not only a bitter remark in the convention, but also a long denunciating letter published in the New York Evangelists and other American papers. I replied to the doctor as well as I could, and was successful in getting respectful hearing before the British public, who are by nature and practice ardent lovers of fair play, especially in a conflict between weak and the strong. Thus did circumstances favour me, and favour the cause for which I strove to be the advocate. After such distinguished notice, the public in both countries was compelled to attach some importance to my labours. By the very ill usage I received at the hands of a Dr. Cox and his party, by the mob on board the Cambria, by the attacks made upon me in the American newspapers, and by the aspirations cast upon me through the organs of the Free Church of Scotland, I became one of that class of men 
who for the moment at least have greatness forced upon them. People became the more anxious to hear for themselves, and to judge for themselves of the truth of which I had to unfold, while therefore it is by no means easier for a stranger to get fairly before the British public. It was my lot to accomplish it in the easiest manner possible. Having continued in Great Britain and Ireland nearly two years, and being about to return to America, not as I left it a slave, but a freeman, leading friends of the cause of emancipation of that country, intimated by their intention to make me a testimonial, not only on grounds of person regarding myself, but also to the cause to which they were so ardently devoted. How far any such things could have succeeded I do not know, but any reasons led me to prefer that my friends would simply give me the means of obtaining a printing press and printing materials, to enable me to start a paper devoted to the interests of my enslaved and oppressed people. I told them that perhaps the greatest hindrance to the adoption of abolition principles by the people of the United States was the low estimate, everywhere in the country, placed upon the Negro as a man, that because of his assumed natural inferiority, people reconciled themselves to his enslavement and his oppression, as things inevitable, if not desirable. The grand thing to be done, therefore, was to change the estimation in which the colored people of the United States were held, to remove the prejudice which, which depreciated and oppressed them, and to provide them worthy of a higher consideration, to disprove their alleged inferiority, and demonstrate their capacity for a more exalted civilization than slavery and prejudice had assigned to them. I further stated that in my judgment a tolerably well-conducted press in the hands of persons of the despised race, by calling out the mental energies of the race itself, by making them acquainted with their own latent powers, and by enkindling among them the hope that for them there is a future, and by developing their moral power, by combining and reflecting their talents. This would prove a most powerful means of removing prejudice, and of awakening an interest in them. I further informed them, and at that time the statement was true, that there was not in the United States a single newspaper regularly published by the colored people, that many attempts had been made to establish the papers, but that up to the time they had all failed. These views I laid before my friends. The result was nearly $2,500 were speedily raised toward the starting of my paper. For this prompt and generous assistance rendered upon my bare suggestion, Without any true personal efforts on my part, I shall never cease to feel deeply grateful, and the thought of fulfilling the noble expectations of the dear friends who gave me this evidence of their confidence will never cease to be a motive for preserving exertion. Proposing to leave England, and turning my face towards America in the spring of 1847, I was met on the threshold with something which painfully reminded me of the kind of life which awaited me in my native land. For the first time in many months spent abroad, I was met with proscription on account of my color. A few weeks before departing from England, while in London, I was careful to purchase a ticket and secure a berth for returning home in the Cambria, the steamer in which I left. Paying therefore the round sum of forty pounds and nineteen shillings sterling. This was first cabin fare, but on going aboard the Cambria I found that the Liverpool agent had ordered my berth to be given to another and had forbidden my entering the saloon. This contemptible conduct met with stern rebuke from the British press, for upon the point of leaving England I took occasion to expose the disgusting tyranny in the columns of the London Times. That journal and other leading journals throughout the United Kingdom held up the outrage to unmitigated condemnation. So good an opportunity for calling out a full expression of British sentiment on the subject had not before occurred and it was mostly fully embraced. The result was that Mr. Cummert came out in a letter to the public journals, assuring me of his regret at the outrage, and promising that the like should never occur again on board his steamers, and the like we believe has never since occurred on board the steamships of the Cunard Line. It is not very pleasant we made the subject of such insults, but if all such necessarily resulted as this one did, I would be very happy to bear, patiently, many more than I have borne of the same sort. Albeit the last of proscription to a man accustomed to equal social position, even for a time as I was, has a sting of the soul hardly less severe than that which bites the flesh and draws the blood from the back of the plantation slave. It was rather hard, 
after having nearly enjoyed two years of equal social privileges in England, often dining with gentlemen of great literary, social, political, and religious eminence, never during that whole time having met with a single word, look, or gesture, which gave me the slightest reason to think my colour was a defence to anybody. I was now to be cooped up in the stern of the Cambria, and denied the right to enter the saloon, lest my dark presence should be deemed an offence to some of my democratic fellow passengers. The reader will easily imagine what must have been my feelings.'